definitely labor-based parties and um, you know, big sort of union-tied parties um, don't look any more equal uh, than the rest of the countries in the region. So it's not the case that the Peronist Party in Argentina or the PT in Brazil uh, has more working class uh, legislators in uh, the National Congress than uh, uh, other parties. In fact, the PT has no uh, working class legislators in uh, Congress. Lula, of course, uh, you know, came, came very much from a working class background, but everybody else is a lawyer, right? Including the current president, Dilma Rousseff, uh, has a, a law degree background. So, um, uh, so this is something that you know maybe something about the structure of the nomination process uh, uh, affects uh, whether or not working class people. Um, uh, become political candidates. Uh, but these are all things that we're sort of puzzling about and, and thinking about, so I, I welcome uh, other suggestions. Should I just take questions? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Uh, we may have. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. So, um, so you'd think that. I'm not sure also in like the interaction. So maybe like hmm. it could work two ways possibly. So when these candidates first enter office, their background may affect the bills that they um, put forward to a greater extent, or it may be that after they've been in office for a longer time, they feel more comfortable introducing bills. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No. So that so that would be specific to the Argentina part of the analysis, and I don't think we've done that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a sense how often legislators are um, constrained and therefore don't really have discretion? So let's say ninety-five percent of the time they're constrained in the decision making. Maybe in Argentina would be a good example where the parties. And the idea that class weaves its way into the decision making becomes less and less likely or apparent. Um, any idea where that might fly? I'm sure it's regional. Yeah, I mean it, it varies a lot by country, and, and I think one of the one of the reasons that Argentina was attractive um, is that it is so disciplined at the at the voting stage. Um, so in countries where there's in most other countries in the region, there's actually a lot less discipline at the voting stage. So, so you would expect even sort of bigger effects um, or you know, actual effects on voting um, in those countries. Um, the problem is, and we, so we, we, we tried to um, replicate our Argentina analysis in Brazil. Um, uh, as Christina can attest, you know, sort of voting data for much of the region is not available, so people actually don't know um, how, their, how legislators voted on lots of bills, but in Brazil it is made public. Um, we you know, hired the research assistants, we did all the work, um, and uh, ran the analysis, and uh, there aren't enough, so there's, you need a certain number of actually working class um, legislators to get to sort of have the power to find an effect, and um, there are not enough bills in Brazilian history to get enough uh, power, statistical power, to uncover any kind of effect because there are so few, it's like 2% of the legislature uh, comes from working class backgrounds. So, um, uh, so you know, the, the estimate is sort of what we expect, but, th but there's no way to sort of um, have any, any idea. So, um, yeah, so in, so in that sense, you know, we're sort of limited to Argentina here uh, for, sort of empirical reasons. But we think, you know, if it's true in Argentina, it should be sort of even more so um, in some of these other cases. Well, even uh, though Argentina just has the party restraint, but oh. what about you know, people that are uh, contributing money or lobbyists? I mean, who knows all those other factors that are involved? Yeah, so, so, uh, so, so people who um, sort of focus on legislatures um, heavily uh, think that, um, the agenda setting stage is one that um, uh, the public pays very little attention to. 
Um, and that's why people think there's a lot more discretion for legislators um, at that stage. And when it comes to voting, the lobbies and the, and the sort of voter media attention um, gets much higher. And so that's why we think there's maybe a, uh, you know, one has to sort of think about the, the types of um, behaviors that where legislators have more or less discretion. But there's, there will be variation across countries as well, yeah. One session, so two years, right. So, so two years, two years. Oh. If you'd looked at more sessions, like under, under a different presidency, or under, how much, in other words, how much is context affecting what you're seeing in that two year period? Say, when, so you look at 2000, 2001, um, that's right near the people transition from this class to the class, right? And so, so it might be, but any, any two years might be easy to feel like that in time history. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so it's, it's, so we think that the, so we actually, so we can, we can separate 2000 and 2001 and we get the same effect. So, you know, a lot of people suggested, oh, you know, 2001, everything is sort of falling apart. That's a particularly sort of bad, um, uh, bad year for Argentine parties. Um, uh, it's hard for me to sort of think of, a, I mean, sure, you know, we could, we could, and, and, and I think we, we want to sort of. Um, motivate others to sort of go and actually study this because I think as a discipline we've sort of abandoned this topic. Um, uh, but it's not clear to me what the co how the context would make this more apparent rather than less. So, you know, there's something, you know, it's a particular presidency, um, but it's not yeah, it's not, so it's a sort of coalition presidency, and in some sense it would be, you know, sort of... Um, right, so, so, so I could imagine that you could find um, stronger effects in other periods in Argentina. Um, probably in the 80s even, you'd, you'd find much stronger effects. Um, but we think, so we think we're sort of at worst underestimating. Um, uh, there's a lot less data for earlier periods. Um, so you know we could do sort of more um, a more recent period, but obviously the parties now are much more of a kind of loose, uh, fragmented kind of system, uh, which is why we thought you know let's go to another country, let's look at Brazil, um, where there's kind of permanent party fragmentation, uh, but. Um, it's, it's hard to sort of uncover effects. My co-author who has done this in the US coded uh, 100 years of, um, got an NSF grant to you know, hire uh, some undergrads to, to code 100 years of uh, data. There are so few working class Congress people um, that you need 100 years of data to, um, but of course in the US we have 100 years of data. And, uh, yeah. Um, so so there's this idea um, that has been suggested in the literature, so that compares the period of the, the 80s and 90s and the 2000s, and the, so in particular in between the 90s and the 2000s, so, so politics in general was more geared toward uh, controlling price, price instability and price volatility in the 90s, whereas in the 2000s, so uh, politics came back to like a nationalist agenda or, I don't know, British privilege project seems to be like more like popular in the 2000s. So, so that could be, I mean, no, it's actually a question. So could that be one way how the context influence, uh, like, the representation of working class preferences in the state and then set? Because if we're looking at this period where, like, redistributive, with a redistributive agenda is what marks that, like, the for the, the overall policy make, because that's just, like, popular in the sense, and across countries, like, in Latin America. So that would be maybe, I mean, that influence the results, would that be, like, would that translate into, like, no of, of preferences for, for so, um, so one thing I think in the Argentine context that doesn't happen until after the collapse, 
so you know after the crisis, the 2000, you know, December 2001 crisis. Um, so I think we're capturing very much a sort of still neoliberal consensus period. Um, uh, it's still not, so you know, there are these kind of meta, um, you know, changes that happen, but you, you still would expect the working class legislators to have different, to, to look different than, than the others. So, you know, sort of regardless of what, you know, so we're in sort of the neoliberal period, but still we find that there's a difference across um, legislators based on their backgrounds. Would that difference look different under a different kind of consensus about policy? I guess, you know, we can't really say, but it doesn't seem to be affecting, if it, you know, if, if the consensus were affecting what was going on in 2000, 2001, then we shouldn't find a, um, a difference here, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry to agree, so I'm a little confused about what you mean by working class background. Because mm. if it's application, it's not necessarily their family background, right? So it's somebody who is working class, but they have a professional right. Right. Yeah. So, um, so we're sort of building on a, a, a literature that um, uh, that ties um, social class to uh, sort of adolescence and the sort of um, occupation that you go into uh, more or less in adolescence, sort of early twenties. Um, that's often um, and certainly in Latin America highly correlated with your family's uh, class backgrounds. We do have for the survey data. Um, the father's occupation as well, and uh, you know, none of the results change when we look at father's occupation. Because um, well, what I was wondering is if it would be interesting to look at the difference if you actually were using father's occupation. Yeah. It'd be interesting to look at if there was any change in the time that the father's occupation was being used as a way to mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, so this is something that we... Right, yeah, no, for sure. And, and the Peronist Party in Argentina, too. Um, and this is something that we want to try to do for a couple of cases, do some historical, uh, some historical work on this and see if um, even some of the transformations of the parties uh, had something, had, is somehow related to the backgrounds of the people who were sort of leading those parties, right? Because that changes around that same time. Um, and, and this is, interestingly, there, there, is, there, um, there is some coding uh, that people have done for Western Europe of um, MPs across um, various Western European, 11, I think, Western European countries from the mid-19th century to the 2000s. Um, and what you see is uh, working class uh, uh, members of parliament uh, sort of entering social democratic parties basically between the 30s and the 70s. So sort of the heyday of the welfare state is when you have uh, working class people in the social, primarily in the social democratic parties, and then they sort of dissipate uh, during the sort of more recent retrenchment period. So um, there's probably something similar happening in the workers' party and the Peronists. And Right. Universities, particularly, allow some kids from working class backgrounds to get the kind of cultural capital that they would need to participate in active politics. And that's a really different process than what we saw here. Yeah. If, yeah. if I'm right about the news. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. Yeah, Erica. Um, so, all of your next steps are all about things that are outside of the themselves, right? So, voters are less likely to back them, working class candidates are less likely to attract and make contributions, and parties are less. Um, what if there's something going on in terms of people from working class backgrounds simply being less likely to step up and run for office? And maybe there's good data on this, so it's a silly question, but you think that there may be different sets of expectations around what are viable career paths, what are desirable career paths, what sort of, what's been socially constructed as, as being a set of expectations for acceptable career choices or not, and that may vary from country 
Yeah, yeah. So, um, so we've tried to think about this, um, and it's it's tough to think about. And we we sort of um, we thought this was a, in part a good place to start because um, if we think that sixty percent of the population is working class, um, at least uh, in many countries up to eighty percent, there's got to be people in there who are willing to run for office, uh, and they do. Uh, they lose. Um, so. Um, yeah, so this is something that we, so it's possible that something like that is going on. We think it's, it's probably not doing most of the explanatory work. Um, so we're sort of starting with the, the sort of demand side, um, but there is a supply side story that surely, you know, um, at, a, at a, you know, a certain level of poverty, it's just not part of the, um, you know, sort of sign up to run for office. Um, but, you know, registering as a candidate is, is fairly easy in a lot of um, lower level uh, uh, yeah, elected offices. So, there's ease and there's set of expectations, right? Yeah. About, you know, what are all my friends doing? What is, what's something that people in my life respect? What's, you know, what are my issues? Yeah, and, and, and exactly, sort of if I think that I might not win, why would I bother, right? Then you get a little bit of a circle. Um, but, but David, yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 So there could be there could be a, a, a ceiling uh, in terms of levels. That's why the sort of the Brazil data that has this information on all candidates, because you know in our sort of attitude sample, these are people actually who actually won. Uh, so uh, the nice thing about the Brazil data is it gives us everybody who ran. Yeah, Frank. How exactly do you control for education? Uh, if, if most of the non-working class folk are actually perhaps um, educated uh, beyond, say, secondary um, education, and most of the working class folk are, have not attained secondary, post-secondary education, then it would seem that you have almost few people to compare, and therefore a very yeah, so this depends a little bit on the category. There's lots of business people who don't have um, post-secondary education in, in a lot of these legislatures. Um, there's a lot of military people who don't have um, post-secondary education. So it's not, so, um, and, I, and I haven't seen, so yeah, so I would guess that most of the people who are working class don't necessarily have um, much post-secondary education, uh, but I think there's enough variation. Some of them don't even have secondary education, right? And so I think there's enough variation when we're comparing working class to um, most of the other categories. Obviously, the sort of white-collar, uh, you know, professors and those um, jobs have that. Um, but but we have looked at this, and I think there's we. We came to the conclusion that there was, yeah, that there was enough um, variation. And it's not that education doesn't have an effect on these attitudes. It does. Um, uh, we just don't think that it's necessarily the right measure of class. Yeah. Uh, can, can you link this discussion with the title of your of your book project, the, the party brands in crisis? <laughs> yeah, the illusion or the, the eluding or almost collapsing of the parties. I mean, like cynicism on the part of the electorate. Or? Um. Uh. No. You know. So. <laughs> um. So. Uh. It's sort of two streams of research that 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 have sort of um are are serendipitous in their their own sort of way, but I. Um, uh, I became, so, I, 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 so my book project focuses on sort of party breakdown and um, why um, parties that, you know, s traditional sort of parties in Latin America, including the Radical Party in Argentina, um, sort of um, become uh, sort of completely uncompetitive uh, national players um, uh, seemingly overnight or really sort of very quickly. Um, and I initially was very sort of um, interested in the, uh, the sort of internal dy dynamics of the party and why, um, what's happening within these parties that, that um, 
uh, makes them collapse. And I think most of the prior work on these kinds of questions focused on that. And eventually I um, sort of came to the realization that there's, there's really the, the interesting story is about voters and why voters are abandoning these, um, uh, these parties. So um, the initial interest was really in sort of what's happening within parties. Um, and that sort of continues to be my interest here. And you know, why is it that parties are not incorporating these people into their, um, uh, into their sort of slate uh, of candidates? Um, but there's been a sort of shift, at least in the book project, towards uh, uh, focusing on voters. And you know, I think there, there will be a, a, a voter um, element uh, to this. Um, uh, my co-author has done a sort of similar survey experiment in the United States. Um, and the background of the legislator doesn't matter at all um, for US voters. Um, so you know, he, he thinks that that part of the story doesn't expose something about parties. Um, and it's something about for voters. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. Uh, uh, yeah, and it's it's actually for the US it's particularly interesting cuz um cuz candidates really make an effort to sell themselves as sort of being working class. Um John Edwards famously sort of talked about being the son of a mill worker even though he's obviously a, you know, very wealthy litigator himself. Um uh but you know, it doesn't seem to play with voters at all. Um, so this is something that we'll, uh, we'll, we'll sort of look at. But um, for me, the angle here has, has really been parties and um, what the internal dynamics are that, uh, uh, that, that make them sort of select candidates in a certain way and you know, with sort of consequences for representation. Yeah, Christine. Yeah. They're across the party system. Yeah, so, um, uh, so we've, we've even tried um, coding for ideology, which in Latin America is, is very difficult. But in the surveys, we actually ask them what idea, so that Salamanca actually asks them um, to place their party uh, on a left right. And, and we can control for that. Um, and there's no effect of that. Um, uh, Um, so in Central America, they're actually uh, more working class. So the proportion of working class among the legislative um, uh, delegation uh, is higher among the right-wing parties in Central America than it is among the left-wing parties. Um, and uh, in, in South America, it's sort of equally distributed across parties. Uh, even, you know, uh, yeah, it's, there's no we haven't seen sort of an obvious um, uh, ideological uh, trend, except for that sort of strange one in Central America. Um, yeah. And in Honduras is the country with the highest proportion of uh, working class. Uh, and it's, it's mostly in the right wing party. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and those are the countries I saw in your original draft that had the highest percentage of working class. Yeah. Honduras, Nicaragua, Salvador. Yeah. Uh, this one, yeah. No, they're on, they're mostly on the right, yeah. Which is surprising. Yeah. Although, you know exactly what, um, you know exactly what left and right are in some of those cases, and how that maps onto economic attitudes is not <coughs> entirely obvious. So potentially, you know, in in the more sort of class um, based. <coughs> countries, we would expect them to, you know, sort of be more um, uh, associated with the left parties. But even that's not necessarily true, right? So, um, yeah. You know, if you look at sort of the labor-based systems, it's not, those aren't the uh, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, those aren't sort of the more representative countries. Yeah. Um, but 
this is something we want to we want to try to look at more systematically across parties. So that's that's sort of a, a next step. And we do have five waves of the survey, so we can also look at um, some change over time, at least in the last couple of decades. Have yeah. you tried to include like the minorities or indigenous groups as, as part of this uh, working class? Like, are they, there's, there's a lot of concern if, if in countries that they have a majority of indigenous population that they're not well represented, and then they're, they're putting their own candidates in that. Is that is there a way to do that by working? Um, we control for that, um, and uh, so the expectation would be that countries with higher indigenous populations would be more or less representative well, in a working yeah, class. Yeah, or you'd, you'd have sort of indigenous parties would be more. Um, uh, it's possible. We don't have that many indigenous parties. <laughs> um, uh, but it's, it's possible. So that's something we could look at. Um, yeah, maybe the MAS has more working class. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's a possibility. Well, if there are no other questions, we thank Noah for. Thank you. This is great. Thanks.